Today is Good Friday, but have you ever wondered why they call it Good Friday? This is the day that we celebrate and commemorate the crucifixion of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But if you're like me, I've always wondered what made this day so good. I mean, if you think about the events that has taken place, especially in the life of Jesus, this has been a long and arduous week. And the fact that he just less than 24 hours ago was in the upper room with his disciples as they were sharing in the Passover meal. He then challenged and shifted to what we now call the Lord's Supper. He left there and went to a place called the Garden of Gethsemane, a familiar place of prayer. And in that moment, the murder machine had been put in place. Can you imagine from Jesus's perspective to have one of his own disciples, Judas, show up, kiss him to identify him? From that moment forward, things changed drastically. That pivotal moment is what led to what we talk about in today. Can you imagine as they dragged him away? And yes, even his disciples, they ran off. They were scared. Before you oftentimes want to look down at the disciples, how many times have you and I faced some moments where we did not act as we probably should have? Fear has a way of sometimes allowing us to move and do things that perhaps we are, think that we're better than, but those disciples on that evening left and Jesus was now headed on his way to what we now call this moment of Good Friday. Can you imagine the, the scripture that allows us to understand the pain and the horror that he felt of that day after having been in front of the rest of those? Pilate once again gave the people an opportunity to spare Jesus. but They chose a man by the name of Bar Jesus instead of our Lord and Savior Jesus. We're given also the record of the pain and trauma that he had to experience on that particular day. He was hit with a cat of nine tails, lash 39 plus one times. You imagine after that moment, if you read scripture, it also tells us the soldiers were mean and were mocking him. They scourged him. And that's simply just an antique word to simply say they beat his face to a pulp. You can imagine in that moment as he's there moving in that particular situation. And now they took his clothes, they bartered it. Then to make things even more harrowing, they decided to make him walk down the V. De La Rosa. You've heard many preachers and people talk about the V. De La Rosa, and that was simply just a space through the marketplace. It's where they would allow the animals to come down as they were leading the animals to the slaughter. That's literally what this was going to be. Crucifixion was about to take place. They placed a beam upon his shoulders and they made him carry this down the V. De La Rosa. You can imagine as the crowd was looking around, I mean, surely everyone knew who Jesus was. They saw this man now carrying this cross, bloodied, battered, and bruised, so much so that as he took his steps, the people were pondering, criticizing, some even spit upon him. As he was making his way to Calvary's cross and Calvary's hill, they called a man by the name of Simon. African man actually from Cyrene because Jesus was bumbling and stumbling with the cross and they commissioned Simon to carry the cross for Jesus. I thought about that especially as we think about what we're in as a world and many of the things that we're having to deal with even now. And I'm grateful that we have a God, our Savior, who's able to carry our burdens, our weight, just like Simon helped Jesus took him up and they finally found themselves to Calvary. It's got to Calvary's hill. Now the execution must be put into place. The story tells us if you go back and know the historics of this particular moment and how they did crucifixion, crucifixion was one of the worst types of deaths you could ever have. By the time he got up there, there were already two other people on the cross. These were the partners of Bar Jesus. Now Jesus would have to be the one in the middle. This is how they would do it. They would lay you down, strip you naked. Then they would totally stretch out your arms. Can you imagine as they bolted one of his arms and tied it to one end of the beam, and did the same to the other side, literally ripping his arms out of socket. With that, they then moved him on the beam that was already in place, they lifted Jesus up on that beam. 
that's the image we have of this cross. And this is what happened the last fateful moments of the life of Jesus. Matter of fact, while he was on that cross, Jesus gave seven sayings. If you read the Gospels, they share the seven last words of Jesus. It's important for us to understand the context for which is given. I mean, to think about the pain and the burden that he's under in that moment. And he will utter seven words, seven sayings from the cross. Each one is significant in their own way. And as we think through and meditate on Good Friday, as we think about what Jesus said for many of us, what exactly can we glean from this moment for Jesus? First words he uttered was, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. I love how he starts that way. I, this perhaps is one of the most thorniest of all the sayings. Jesus, they are surrounded not by family, not by friends, but by foes. There were many people there who thought Jesus deserved this treatment. There were those religious people who believed that he was a blasphemer. There were soldiers there who did not believe in his divinity. So you must understand when he spoke this word, he was not speaking to family and friends, but those who opposed him. And to think about what he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Power, forgiveness was the first statement that Jesus spoke on that cross. And maybe it's a challenge for us because in the state that Jesus was in, I wonder how many of us would say forgiveness as our first word. Jesus was about to give the second saying. It's interesting for us to note that so much was going on around Jesus because Jesus was not being crucified in isolation. Matter of fact, there were two thieves that were being crucified on his left and right. Many have speculated they were perhaps the crime partners of our Jesus, the one who had been given up so that Jesus could be crucified. And if you read some of the accounts, it's interesting. These two initially were on the same page telling Jesus, if you got all that power, take us off this cross. But if you keep reading the gospel narrative and the trajectory for which it has, it says to us that at one point, perhaps one of the thieves decided to have a change of heart. He started to deride the other one and say, man, listen, we deserve to be crucified. But it's obvious the one that is between us doesn't deserve it. And he looks over to Jesus, and I can imagine this had to be a rough moment, probably his whole life flashing before him. And he says to Jesus, remember me. Simple prayer, remember me. I guess he can remember as much stuff that he had been through. And as he already said, it was, he deserved to be there. But in that moment, he looked to the bloody, battered Jesus on the cross and said, remember me. And one of the most powerful sayings to me personally, Jesus responds to him by saying, today you will be with me in paradise. Not tomorrow, not next year. Today, right in this moment, you will be with me in paradise. That second saying was a saying of mercy. It shows us how even in moments when we're not at our best, I'm grateful. That's what perhaps makes Good Friday good. It reminds us of the goodness of God's mercy. The third word he uttered from that fateful cross on that day was there was his mother that was close by. His beloved disciple had been in that place. And at that time, you got to understand, Jesus, being the oldest of Mary's children, was in charge of everything. We've never been given the full account of when Joseph died, who was the husband of Mary. But we do realize that he died at some point in the life of Jesus. And because he was the oldest one, all of the household, the family fell at the responsibility of his feet. With Jesus dying, now this would leave his mother unprotected. That's why the third word he said from the cross was simply this, mother behold thy son and son behold thy mother. It was simply a saying of transfer that he wanted his own friend and brother, the beloved disciple John, to make sure that Mary was taken care of. In that moment, not only was he speaking forgiveness and mercy, but he also was speaking about supervision, authority, sharing this moment so that he would make sure that his own mother would be taken care of. The fourth thing that happened in that moment, perhaps is one that we can all understand, especially in this moment. 
Jesus yells out in a very loud voice, Eli, Eli, Sabbathene. In other words, it simply says, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? This is what we call the mid word. It is the halftime word, if you will. It's the fourth word out of seven. It is perhaps one of those words that many people who love Jesus and love the gospel story struggle with, especially many of us who know Jesus to be one with the Father. How can one who is one with the Father feel forsaken by the Father? But yet you must understand that literally, if you go to the background of this particular saying, it was really one of the Psalms, one of the Psalms that as children, Jewish children would recite. And it started that way. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? But it also kept going to talk about how God would always take care of them. Maybe this was not a cry in that moment of being forsaken as much as it was a cry to God to say that, God, I'm still trusting you even in this painful and perilous situation. I know for many this is a hard word, but it has brought me a sense of relief even in this moment. Because I know that as much as we're going through with a global pandemic, we're quarantined, we're told to stay inside, there feels like moments as if God has forsaken us. But the truth of the matter is simply this, is that even in the moments, I appreciate this about God, He can handle our painful moments. He can handle our cries of inquiry. He can handle a lot of stuff that does not make sense for us. It was the fourth word, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The fifth word that Jesus said from the cross was, I thirst. Many have wondered, what is he thirsty for? He's in the midst of dying. Some would suggest that this particular saying from Jesus just reminds of his humanity. I mean, we get to see all of Jesus as it evolves itself on the cross. Each word begins to unpack something for us to understand. His last fateful day shares with us who he truly is. But this I thirst is not just showing us on one hand his humanity, but also it shows us the acceptance of his assignment. If you remember, as he was in the Garden of Gethsemane on Monday, Thursday, he asked the Lord to take this cup away from him. Let this cup pass by me. Could it be that the fifth word uttered by Jesus from the cross was not just about his humanity, but could it be that the cup he had asked less than 24 hours ago to pass by, he was now willing to accept. And for many of us, I think it teaches a powerful principle that in life, there's some things that we may not want to taste, but for the simple fact of understanding it's God's will, we'll thirst for stuff that we know may not taste good to us. How do you know that's what life is? Life does not always go the way we want it to go. But what we learn from Jesus is that when it's his will, the best thing we can do is desire his will and not our will. Sixth word that Jesus said from the cross was simply this, it is finished. Strange saying, I admit, what's the it he's discussing? He did not say I am finished, but he said it is finished. Perhaps this was Jesus telling us all, not just those who were surrounding the cross, but the work of redemption has now been completed. Understand that when you look back at his birth, he was foretelling it the whole time. Matter of fact, when he was born, he was born to die. His death would mean atonement for us. It simply meant that our lives would be saved from the pain and horror of eternal damnation. So the it he speaks of simply in this moment is finality as saying the work has been completed. He's now offering to all of us who accept him salvation because he has become literally in that moment our slain lamb. I don't know, but it's good to know that no matter the hardship and the pain, and we do learn from this moment that what we struggle with has an expiration date. It is finished. And that is what leads us to the seventh and final saying of Jesus from the cross. He started with Father and he ends with Father. He says, 
Father, into my hand, I commend my spirit. This moment he decides to, as he gives his last few breaths, can you imagine as the other beside him on his left and right have had their legs broken? What makes crucifixion so difficult is that it causes it hard for you to breathe. You die literally of asphyxiation. They didn't break Jesus's legs trying to breathe on his own. And as he got ready to breathe his last, he said, Father, into thy hands, I commend my spirit. Spirit, that word, ruah, breath. It's almost as if he's saying, God, I'm giving you my breath, my ruah. And anybody understands anything about that? It reminds me when I was a kid growing up in Greensboro, North Carolina, we would go down to the local pool at Windsor Center. And when I learned how to swim, it was an, a big day for me. But in order to really be effective in swimming, one thing that I had to make sure that I mastered was how to hold my breath. Holding my breath was when I could go underwater for an extended period of time. I learned how to grow from 20 seconds to 30 seconds to eventually a minute. But there was one thing about holding the breath is that we were never meant to hold our breath forever. And as we come to this moment of Good Friday, Jesus has shared his last sayings from the cross the final word is powerful from this perspective that he's telling God, I'm letting you hold my breath. But as I told you, as I learned in the Windsor Center pool, we don't have to hold our breath forever. And here's the good news about Good Friday. As bad as it was, as tough as it was, as painful as it was, here is the hope of it. He didn't have to hold his breath too long because three days later, Sunday's coming. Let's get it.